Hi everyone, welcome back to Lifting the Lamp. Today I'm continuing the video series on Kabbalah. And I want to give an overview today of the Tree of Life and more particularly the Ten Sephiroth. So if you haven't watched my previous videos on Kabbalah, I suggest you do so for a bit of background so you understand what the Tree of Life is and its significance and what the Sephiroth are and their significance. Uh, but that's what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, as well as, by way of introduction, some of the ways that the Tree of Life is used in spiritual practice. So by way of uh, recap, quickly, what is the Tree of Life? The Tree of Life is a map. It is a map of all of the abstract archetypal forces which comprise existence uh, ordered in such a way that they show the successive unfoldment of the divine from the absolute down to the manifest world that we inhabit and everything in between. The tree of life can be a map applied to two different universes of two different scales. On the one hand, the Tree of Life is a map of the macrocosmic universe, that is to say, the external universe. Uh, and the kinds of principles that comprise the universe, uh, but framed in a kind of spiritual way. Uh, on another scale, it is a map of the microcosmic universe, that is to say, the inner world, uh, our own psyche, our own psychology, and the different, the different levels of the psyche and the different kind of symbols that inhabit our consciousness. And of course, the microcosm is a reflection of the macrocosm, as above, so below. And so it is only right that the map for the inner and outer worlds should be the same. But of course, as Kabbalah is a system of mysticism, we're mostly concerned with the microcosmic world, with the inner psychological world. And so that is primarily the use of the Tree of Life. The Tree of Life really is a way of organizing all of the different ideas in our psyche so that we understand how it fits into the greater order of the universe, and also how we can trace all of the different manifestations of divinity back to its source. And, and as a way of understanding every face or every facet of the divine in manifestation. So when you're studying esotericism, there are a lot of symbols and archetypes and ideas which are really manifestations of a greater principle, uh, which you sort of have to memorize if you want to understand the meanings of visions or dreams that you might have and be able to, be able to interpret those quickly and easily. And Kabbalah becomes a tool for you to be able to do this. Uh, if you've ever seen certain movies or shows such as Sherlock with Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, you'd be familiar with the idea of the mind palace. People who need to retain a lot of information in their head and have a very structured way of organizing complex information in their head will we'll, we'll use a kind of a visualization called the mind palace where they might visualize a castle or a very large house with many different rooms. And in the rooms, there are various different objects of a certain type representing memories or ideas of a certain type. And there might be certain hallways or stairways connecting one room to another, which is a way of associating one idea with another. This is very similar to the Tree of Life. Uh, if you 
can organize memories through associations and categorizations. It's much easier for you to recall information quickly and easily than if you just have a clutter of information in your head. And so when you're memorizing different archetypes, different symbols, uh, and, and organizing them according to the tree of life, you're building a spiritual mind palace, in a sense. Uh, a mind palace which, when you enter it, will allow you to n easily navigate your own psyche and to understand the universe and everything in it. Uh, as it's said, uh, the house of the Father has many mansions. Uh, so let's, let's start with the bare basics of the Tree of Life. That is the ten sephiroth. The ten sephiroth can be understood as uh, the physical world plus the nine successive layers of heaven, leading from uh, the closest to material existence all the way up to the highest heaven. And each one represents a different uh, archetypal force in the universe. And the way to understand each sephirah is by understanding that each sephira is attributed to a level of the cosmos, according to the ancients, uh, usually one of the seven spheres of the planets, but not always. It's also attributed to a number from one to ten, and each number has its own spiritual symbolism associated with it. And each sephira can also be associated with a colour. Now, there's a bit of disagreement about the specific colour scheme for the Tree of Life, but the most universally agreed upon colour scheme for the Tree of Life is what's called the Queen Scale of Colour, which comes down to us from the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And that's what I'm going to be referring to as the colour scheme of the Tree of Life. So let's begin at the beginning. According to the Kabbalists, everyday life, the sort of experience of everyday mundane existence is the very lowest level of the tree. This is Malkut, the kingdom. Malkut is attributed the number 10. 10 being the number of completion, being the very end point of uh, manifestation. Something has fully come into existence. And this is the meaning that the four tens in the tarot carry. And in Malkut, it's a bit different to the other Sephira. Uh, and as it is physical existence, Malkut is not attributed to one of the planets in the heavens or some other level of the heavens, but it is attributed to the earth, that is to say, the world. In terms of its color scheme, Malkut, it's divided into four, unlike the other Sephiroth. And each of its four quarters is given its own colour. And those colours are russet, citrine, olive and black. And what these colours really are is brown mixed with red, yellow, green or blue respectively. And red, yellow, green and blue represent the four classical elements of fire, air, earth and water respectively. And the colour brown represents the earth in the sense of the most material level of existence. You think of the brownness of the soil of the world that you pick up. And so what we have is the four elements made manifest in the world. And that is Malkut. That is just your everyday humdrum existence. Uh, subject to the elements, subject to the forces of nature. Uh, very familiar to everybody, I'm sure. Once you leave Malkut, the next level is the sphere of Yesod, or foundation. This is technically a heavenly realm, but it is very close to the earth, and it is symbolized by the planet of the moon. Now, before I go on any further, I'm going to be talking a lot about the seven planets. Uh, of classical astronomy, I realize that hundreds of years have gone by and we understand that 
the solar system is heliocentric rather than geocentric now. Uh, but the levels of the cosmos, uh, according to Hermetic Kabbalah, uh, does correspond with the order of the planets uh, as they were believed to be by the ancients, who also counted the sun and the moon as planets and didn't know about the planets beyond Saturn as they weren't visible. Uh, but in a post-Copernican world, we can understand that this grading of the levels of the cosmos still has significance in the sense of understanding different levels of the psyche. And so this ordering of the planets must be accepted uh, on no other terms than that it was a familiar system of symbolism to the time in which these ideas arose. And it is for that reason that we have inherited those particular symbols as uh, referring to these different levels of the cosmos. But if you're thinking about literal planets, then you're kind of missing the point because each one of these planets is, is only meant to be a signifier of a much more abstract principle. But I digress. So we have the planet of the moon. Uh, the moon, if you think about legends of werewolves or how people behave during the full moon, uh, the effect on the tides of the ocean uh, with the waters being representative of human emotion, then the moon is very much about our unconscious. It's very much about uh, the world of uh, dreams and delusions, those kinds of hidden elements of our psyche which can have an undue influence over us. Uh, so this is, and it's also, the moon is also associated with the world of death because the ancients believed that when you dream, your soul leaves your body much the same way as it does when it leaves the body to to go to the afterlife. And the color of Yesod is purple, uh, very associated with the moon and lunar kind of cults. And it's given the number of nine, which is quite an unstable number in tarot. Uh, it's trying to move towards some semblance of order, but there's still an element, a strong element of disorder in that number. So next above Yesod is Hod. This is the sphere of Mercury. Uh, and as Mercury is the messenger of the gods, it's very much a sphere of communication and the intellect. Uh, very much associated with rational thought and a very, what would normally in the past be thought of as a left hemisphere sort of oriented brain, even though we've kind of moved beyond the left right hemisphere dichotomy in psychology today. Uh, Hod has the color orange associated with it, a very energetic color, uh, much like the activity and energy of the mind, which is always flitting from one thing to the next and it's associated with the number eight. Eight is a very ordered and structured number, but it also contains uh, movement within it. After Hod, there is the sphere of Netzach. This sphere is associated with the planet Venus and the color green and the number seven. Netzach is very much about desire. The way that the human psyche works is that our emotions, uh, our emotional brain very easily overrides our rational brain. And so very often it is a emotional judgment that precedes a rational judgment. This is how propaganda is able to work and convince people of a certain truth. And so Netzach represents that 
emotional kind of impulse that precedes the calculating rationality of Hod. Uh, Venus is a very uh, emotional planet, and so that's the reason for its attribution on this part of the tree. But, but the, the planet Venus, of course, is also associated with a specific emotion, that of love, and Netzach carries that meaning as well. Um, but it's not necessarily a very refined expression of love in the sense of some kind of universal or divine love. It's much more of an emotional kind of a love, uh, which is still necessary and plays a role. And because it is associated with that kind of love or desire, it's very associated with the natural world, which is very much driven by that kind of love. Uh, and so it's given the color green. And Netzach is given the number seven uh, because the number seven, although considered quite a harmonious number, uh, in the context of the tarot, uh, it's, it's very much a unsettled number. It's, it's a number that wants to, to, to move from one thing to the next. So it's very related to attraction and desire in that sense. Next on the tree, we have Tifereth. This is attributed to the sphere of the sun, the number six and the color yellow or gold. Tifereth lies at the center of the tree, as indeed the sun lies at the center of the solar system. It's very associated with the sense of self or individuality that we have. And it is very associated with the life-giving principle, which governs all things, which the sun is a symbol for. And for, for our own psychology, that is our sense of consciousness, our sense of self-awareness. That is the point from which the light emanates through the rest of our psyche. Uh, but Tifereth is also very associated with harmony. Uh, it centers the whole tree. It grounds the whole tree uh, around itself. And the number six is considered a number representing harmony. And you might think of the harmonious way that the solar system is organized around the sun. Above Tifereth, we have Geburah. This is the sphere of severity. It's attributed to the color red and the planet Mars and the number five. The archetypal force represented by Geburah is very strong, but also very harsh. It's very associated with, with judgment or severity as contrasted with mercy. Uh, if you th think about Mars, Mars is the god of war, and red is a very fiery, active kind of color. And so this is a very ruthless kind of energy, the energy of Geburah. It, it, it seeks to, to combat or do away with that which is uh, no longer serving us. Uh, it compels us to, to fight for our place in existence, to struggle for our place in existence, uh, and to define that which is with us and against us. Not in a dogmatic sense, but in the sense of uh, having to find our place in the greater whole and having to overcome fetters or obstacles to what is truly meant for us uh, in finding that place. And it's also about uh, cutting away the old, purging the old so that we can continue to grow and become stronger. The number five is, in this context, a number which 
uh, having come from the solid foundation created in four is all about uh, moving out to that which is beyond that. After Geburah, moving up the tree, we reach Chesed. This is the sphere of mercy. It has the number four and the color blue, and its planet is Jupiter. Now, Ches Chesed is very much uh, set in contrast to Geburah. This is a very open, expansive, generous, giving sphere, uh, and that's why it's attributed to Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter is, is associated with good fortune, optimism, uh, and just expanding the pie, creating greater abundance for everyone. Now, the color blue is a very calming, peaceful color, uh, which fits very much with the concept of divine mercy. And the number four is a very stable number. It's a... Uh, and through that sort of peace comes a kind of stability and order. And of course, Jupiter was the king of the gods in Roman mythology. So there, there's a kind of a, a generosity through order or keeping of the peace, a sort of benevolent authority, which is represented by the sphere of Chesed, uh, the benevolent governance of the universe. Now, when we move on from Chesed in the Tree of Life, things start to get a little bit more abstract. We need to cross the abyss, which is the gulf in understanding that lies between the familiar symbolic world of physical existence and also the kind of levels of the psyche that still have some kind of form to them or familiarity to them and then a much more abstract and, from our point of view, strange level of manifestation. Uh, and the first of the spheres uh, above the abyss, moving from the bottom of the tree up, is Bina. Bina is assigned the color black, is associated with Saturn, and the number three. Bina is often thought of as a kind of great dark ocean, uh, a kind of abyssal ocean where uh, everything is dissolved, uh, all form gives way, and there's just a black void, uh, hence the color black. And of course, the planet Saturn in medieval astrology was considered the dweller at the threshold. This was the outermost of the visible planets, and so uh, it, the planet Saturn was considered to be the edge of the known universe. And so uh, Saturn was simultaneously a planet of, of, of restriction and structure and separation, but also as it, as it represented the, the outer limit of the world of separation and restriction, also represented the kind of frontier of that which is structureless and orderless and chaotic. Uh, and, and that is very much what Bina is. Um, ordinary forms are starting to break down. Uh, everything is being subsumed into the void. Um, but Bina is also considered part of the supernal triad. Um, and is given the number three. The number three really is the first number which uh, can be considered any level of true manifestation in the world. You think about three dimensions, you can only, you can only reduce things down to three principles. Uh, there's sort of positive and negative polarities plus the synthesis of the two or the, uh, the sort of neutral between them. So three is very much, it, much like Saturn represents the edge of the known universe to the ancients, the number three represents the, the very edge of manifestation, the very beginning of manifestation as we know it. Once we leave Bina, 
uh, we arrive at Hokmah. Now this is the first of the spheres in our journey up to the Absolute, which has no planet attributed to it. Uh, it's sometimes attributed to the sphere of the sphi fixed stars or the zodiac signs, uh, but it really represents a, a a level of the heavens that is above the planetary spheres and getting much closer to what the Gnostics called the Pleroma. And what Hokmah really represents is the primordial kind of creative principle. Uh, the very first impulse of creation is probably the easiest way to describe it. Uh, it's given the color gray, which is a very dualistic color because it combines black and white. And it's given the number two, which of course is the number of duality. Uh, but this is not a level of existence um, that can exist other than in a very abstract, rudimentary form, a very basic duality, which gives rise to the first impulse of creation. And finally, we arrive at Keta, the crown, which has the number one and the color white, and of course, no planet. But this represents the very highest level of the manifest heavens. Uh, and the color white represents that absolute, the, the absence of any other color, the absence of any other form whatsoever, uh, not even the impulse towards creation that we see in the primordial two of Hokmah. Uh, this is pure light, plain and simple. It is number one, it is the first. Now, this is the beginning of all things. And this is when, and as it is the number one, it is the state where all is united in the absolute, without distinction. There's really not much more to say about it. Uh, any other definition will only corrupt the idea of Keta. So that is the tree of life uh, in very broad strokes. Hopefully that's helped you to understand the Sephiroth. Uh, there's a lot more to unpack with Kabbalah. There's the 22 paths. There's the f all of the different elements of the tree that I discussed in my previous videos on this topic. Eventually, I'll get to those. But I, I hope that I've at least given an overview of the important parts of the tree of life. Uh, if you've got any thoughts on this topic, leave your comments down below. Like this video if you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel to support my work. Thanks again for listening and I'll see you next time.